Images can kill your site performance. And yeah, you could probably use that one random free tool that you found to crunch down the size, but now the designers are on your case because they're just not crisp or clean images anymore. They're kind of fuzzy. And so you go back to their app 2x version with the five megabyte file size. Sure, it takes five minutes to download, but at least you don't hear complaints from your users. You just want to worry about not hearing complaints from your own team. Now there is a better way to get those crisp, clear images without the huge load time. To get that beautiful middle ground, you're gonna have to understand two things that we're talking about in this video, what format you're supposed to use and what size you should use. Let's tackle formats first, because if you understand this one thing, you have 80% of your goal already done with only 20% of the effort. To give you a heads up, we're gonna be talking about colors a lot, especially in this context. And we wanna make sure that it's clear. It's not just, you know, red, green, blue, the named colors that you can come up with in your, in your head. Just think about colors as information because the more you zoom into a color, the same blue may not be the same blue to the computer at every pixel, but it's still classified as blue to us humans. On the web, you'll run into JPEGs and PNGs, most commonly for image formats. And they both treat color information very differently, which is why knowing the difference will yield immediate site improvement as far as performance and load time. Unlike the CSI or espionage movies that we love to watch, when you zoom into a JPEG or a PNG in real life, it does not become clearer. In fact, you'll actually see a lot more pixels, it's gonna be more blurry, and as you go in and look at each individual color, there are actually hundreds of colors that you wouldn't have even known were creating that image. The only time that you're allowed to zoom in on an image and actually have it still maintain that crisp quality to it is going to be with vector images. And those are most often represented by SVG format, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the video. So now let's actually talk shop here. When somebody gives you an image, I would not trust it because most people don't actually understand the difference between a JPEG and a PNG. And so honestly, the file that they gave you is probably already in the wrong format. You're going to wanna look at the actual image and make a determination from there to see whether or not it's in the correct format. Here are some mnemonics to help you remember which format works best for which situations. When you're thinking about JPEGs, think, just photographs. And when you're thinking about PNGs, you can think, photos, not good. Or, <laughs> please, no gradients. Let's talk about JPEGs. JPEGs excel when there is a ton of color information. Even if the photo is black and white, which means basically two colors to us, the computer can see a ton of different colors in each pixel, ranging from the lightest shade of gray to the darkest shade of gray. The only time you're gonna break your photo rule for JPEGs is if you have some kind of transparency in the image. JPEGs don't support transparency, so you will have to take that slight performance hit by getting that cool floating image effect. But not all is lost because you still have the sizing tools and also some other web formats that may help to optimize your image and still take down that load time just a little bit. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. On the other hand, we have PNGs, which love graphics, icons, and anything that looks like it was drawn on a computer. Often graphics, icons, things like that are drawn in vector format and then exported out as a PNG. And that's because PNGs love those minimal amounts of color, information colors, and they're gonna be able to crunch those, that small amount of information into something really well optimized. Pro tip, PNGs have two options for you in Photoshop when you're saving for web and devices, PNG 24 and PNG 8. If you have any transparency at all, your best bet is to go with a PNG 24 because it's gonna get you a really clean output even if you have drop shadows, for example. If you don't have to worry about transparency, you can reduce your file size even further by choosing the PNG 8. Maybe you like to think of it as PNG 24, see through the floor. PNG 8, only if it's opaque. <laughs> All right, so any gradients, however, that are added to an image that would otherwise be a PNG, if it's got that gradient in it, you've got to switch it probably to the JPEG. 
And the reason why, again, is because that color density really adds up and PNGs just aren't built for that kind of support. As you can see, by simply choosing between the correct file types, the file size is reduced dramatically. Now we're on to size and dimension, and those actually are the other most impactful factor in getting that great web optimization without loss of quality. However, it does rely on understanding the context that your image will end up being in. The larger the image dimensions, the larger the file size. If you wanna keep things small, here are my recommendations from over 10 years of experience outfitting these images to websites as both a designer and a developer. JPEGs, pretty easy actually. Just fit them as close as you can to their rendered dimensions that will be on your largest screen size that you support. If the PNG that you're working with has a graphic or especially if it has text, you're gonna wanna max it out to twice the rendered size of wherever it's gonna end up being. The reason why we do that is to help keep things clear on a retina screen or other high density display. However, if the PNG was only a PNG just because of some kind of transparency need, I would still match it with the JPEG rule of going as close as you can to the actual rendered size. Ultimately, I try to keep all of my images below 100 kilobytes. Now for images that are on things like heroes or, or banners where they really need to be pretty large and you just can't get the file size down based on the dimensions that you're working with, I would still stick with maybe under 200, maybe 250 kilobytes as the absolute max. Once you exceed that 250 kilobytes as a maximum, it really does hurt the load time. And so the best way may be to actually chop up your images so you load part of them one at a time. That's not ideal. So another way you can do it is actually by choosing some of the modern web formats that will help decrease your file size as well. What I mean by modern web formats are the amazing SVG and WebP formats. SVGs are finally web safe, which means that you don't have to worry too much about browser compatibility anymore. For your best looking icons, other graphics that are similar to that, or logos, you're gonna wanna use the SVG. One way to keep the file size of an SVG down is actually by scaling down both the image and the canvas and then exporting it as an SVG. And the reason why is because SVGs are math drawn, which means you can infinitely scale them up or down without any loss of quality, which makes it really awesome. Just make sure that you've outlined your strokes before you do that. WebP is a new image format that we're able to use in our optimization tool belt. In my experience, I've seen WebPs reduce my image sizes anywhere from 20 to 70%. The only thing you have to worry about about the WebP format is browser compatibility. So you definitely want to use a picture element with source set in your HTML so that you have some fallbacks to the JPEG or PNG original file. If you want to convert your images to WebP format, you can follow me over to this video right here and we will create a Python script to do this for you automatically.